Did you know there is a talking donkey in the Bible? Well, you'll get to learn that account today. But really, this account that we're looking at from Numbers chapters 22 through 24 is really more about the character of Balaam. And Balaam is a rather mysterious character. If you were to just read Numbers 22 through 24, you might think that he is a, a pretty good guy, that he is a guy who wants to obey and serve God. But then if you read a little more carefully, there's some things that are a little suspicious there that indicate otherwise. And then if you look at places where Balaam is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, they actually paint Balaam as a kind of slimy character. And so I'm going to give you a summary of, of how I understand Balaam after studying it a bit. And how I understand this situation. Now Balaam is described as someone who practiced divination. And basically divination is kind of, probably comparing to, to today, it would be like a psychic or someone who reads palms or tarot cards that tries to tell the future through things like that. And Balaam was known for being able to curse people and they would be cursed and bless people and they would be blessed. And there was a certain king. He was the king of Moab and his name was Balak. And the Israelites had recently set up their camp outside of his country. And Balak had heard how the Israelites had defeated other nations. Recently he had heard that about how the Amorites were defeated by the Israelites. And he is getting nervous. And he sees how powerful they are as God has been with them. And so he sends some messengers to Balaam and says, please come and curse the Israelites so that hopefully I have a chance to defeat them. But here's the interesting part about Balaam. It seems he also had a knowledge and even a belief in the one true God. And so potentially, as he was doing his divination and that type of work, he had also heard of this powerful God of the Israelites and thought, I am getting power from potentially evil spirits and everything over here. But hey, if this God is powerful, then let's see if I can get some of his power and use that too. And that seems to, to me to be what's going on. And so, oh, in this instance, in this situation, as these messengers come and tell Balaam to come curse the Israelites, Balaam says, I need to check with God first and see if that's all right. And God says, no, you can't go curse the Israelites. So the messengers go back to Balak, but Balak <laughs> sends them back. And he says, no, tell Balaam, I will honor you. And you get the idea that I'll make you wealthy if you come curse the Israelites. And Balaam again says, let me check with God. And God says, you can go, but only do or only say what I tell you to say. And so Balaam goes, but here's the interesting part. Balaam goes, but then it says, God is angry because he went. And here it seems that God knew his motives, that Balaam wasn't purely wanting to serve God. But it seems, as we continue to read this account, that Balaam kept hoping that he would get a chance to curse the Israelites and get this reward from Balak. And so God sends the angel of the Lord, is what it describes, and sends him to stand in the path as Balaam is heading to meet Balak. But Balaam doesn't see this angel, at least at first, but his donkey does. And so the first time his donkey sees this angel holding a sword, and the donkey goes off of the path into a field. And Balaam beats the donkey because he's upset. And similar things happen two more times. And so after this donkey is beaten for the third time, God has this donkey speak. 
And the donkey basically asks, why have you beaten me these three times? And they have a bit of a conversation. But then at that point, God opens Balaam's eyes so that he sees this angel of the Lord with a sword. And the angel of the Lord says, if your donkey hadn't stopped, I would have killed you. And Balaam says, well, I've sinned. Should I turn back? And the angel of the Lord says, no, continue. But only say the words that God tells you to say. And so Balaam ends up meeting with Balak. And Balak brings him up on a hill to look over the Israelites. And he asks Balaam to curse them. And Balaam says, well, I can only say what God tells me to say. And Balaam says a blessing over the Israelites. And then Balak moves him to another hill, hoping that God will let him curse them from there. And again, God makes Balaam bless them. And it happens one final time. And in all of this, it seems that Balaam is saying what God wants him to say. It seems even maybe that God forced him to say certain things. But after this is all over, Balaam later gives more advice to the Moabites at how to make the Israelites weak. It seems, again, he was in it wanting this reward for helping the Moabites. Now, as I've looked at this account, I've seen a lot of lessons we can learn here. But I've had a tough time figuring out how to boil it down into a sermon that is smooth and understandable. So I'm just going to keep it pretty simple. The first thing I want to look at and learn from is Balaam's foolishness. And then the second thing we see here is God's faithfulness. So as we start out looking at Balaam's foolishness, I want to look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 15 through 16. And this is one of those passages where it becomes clear that Balaam really didn't have a heart to serve God. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 15 through 16. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. There we see he, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. He, he wanted to gain from doing what was wrong. And I think a way we could say it as we think about who Balaam was, was that he wanted God to serve him. He had heard of this powerful God, and he had this business going where he would bless people and curse people. And he thought, if God can make my business better, if God has power, I want that power for me to use. And we need to take a moment to think, are we ever like that? Because you see, we as humans have a terrible tendency to make life all about us. And so a question that we need to pause and ask in the Christian life sometimes is, who is serving who? Am I serving God? Or do I think that God needs to be serving me? It seems that Balaam believed that God should be serving him. So as we think of that question, I just want to offer a few signs that you might believe that God should be serving you. The first sign is that you get more spiritual in certain situations. So around certain friend groups, the ones you know are Christians, the ones you know appreciate it, you'll talk about spiritual things. You'll live out your Christian life. But then you act and talk differently around other groups where they would look down on you for your faith in Christ. Another place you see this is funerals. It's amazing how spiritual people get 
when confronted with death that at a funeral. That when they lose a loved one, it doesn't seem to matter whether that loved one demonstrated a faith in Christ or whether they lived like they didn't believe in Jesus. It, at the time of a funeral, everyone wants to believe their loved one is in heaven. And so at that point, they're interested in Jesus. They're interested in what Christ has done to save us. But then it seems like quickly later on they forget about Jesus again. Or you could, sometimes this happens just in bad situations in life. Maybe you have a loved one dealing with illness. And so you start to become more aware of God at those times. And you want God to heal them. But then once the illness has passed, you put God on the back burner again. And so you view God kind of like a first aid kit. That hopefully you don't have to use him. But he's awfully handy when you do need him. He's awfully handy when the going does get tough. Here's another sign that you believe that God should serve you. You try to trick God. And so you basically go through the motions, doing those things you know you're supposed to do without really having a heart to know and love Jesus. Perhaps you attend a church. Maybe it's when life gets tough. You attend church more hoping that God will smooth your life out again. Or maybe you even attend church every week. You, you go through that motion because you know it's supposed to be important. But then you forget about God the rest of the week. And so you hope you can pull the wool over God's eyes, making him think that you really love him when it's clear the rest of the week that you don't care that much. And really, in all of this, you don't care about growing closer to Jesus. You just want God to make your life go smoothly. Another sign that you believe God should serve you. You love God's blessings, but you avoid sacrifice. And so that can be the case financially. You're thankful that God has blessed you financially. But when it comes time to give to your church or to give to other ministries, you hold on awfully tightly to your money. You're unwilling to sacrifice to serve God. It can be the case with relationships. You're get glad that God has blessed you with friends, but you're unwilling to go out of your way to reach out and be a friend to someone else. Maybe someone who isn't as much fun to be around. Or maybe someone who is down and out. You're unwilling to sacrifice in that way. Or you're thankful God has blessed you with a comfortable life but you would be unwilling to give up some of your comfort to serve him. Or you, this can be the case when you look at how you spend your time. You're unwilling to let God have a say in how you spend your time. You're unwilling to sacrifice your time to serve him. Or it can be the case with planning your future. You want God to bless you in the future, but you don't really want God to have much say in what your future looks like. Or it could be the future of your children. That you want to teach your children to grow up and to have a good job and to have financial stability and to be well-rounded people. But you don't teach your children that they should be seeking God's will first. What if God's will is that one of your children be a missionary to India? Would you be okay with that? And this can also be the case with salvation. You're thankful for the blessing of salvation because you like the idea of going to heaven. But you really don't want your faith in God to ha have an impact on how you live your life here on earth. You love God's blessings, but you're unwilling to sacrifice for him. Another sign that you think God should serve you 
is that you pick and choose from God's word. There's certain passages that you find encouraging, they make you feel good, and you like those. But passages that deal with sins in your life, passages that are harder to understand, you don't really follow those. You don't pay attention to them. For instance, you like scripture about heaven, but you don't like scripture about hell. And so you ignore that. And the same can happen with God's law. You like certain laws that God has in the Bible, but other laws don't really make sense to you, so you perhaps ignore them or downplay them. I think this happens with sexual morality. That for many people, they can live with God saying homosexuality is wrong, because perhaps to them it's a bit distasteful anyway. But when it comes to sleeping with someone before you're married, then we start to say, that's a bit more understandable. That God's being a little too strict on that one. And so we wink at couples living together. Do you believe that God should serve you? The final sign that you believe God should serve you is that you compartmentalize your life. So you say, here are a few areas that my faith in Christ should impact, that God has a say in these areas. But over here are all these areas that my faith really shouldn't make a difference in. It doesn't need to change how I speak. It doesn't need to change how fast I drive. It doesn't need to change the food I eat or how I take care of my body. It doesn't need to change how I spend my money. And so you compartmentalize your life. And as we think of these signs that you believe God should serve you, if you have an ounce of honesty in you, you will have to admit that some of those signs describe you. That there are plenty of times where you believe that the Christian life is about God serving you instead of you serving God. And as you do so, then you are being foolish like Balaam. Who is serving who? We need to be reminded that our lives are about serving God. God created us and therefore our lives are to be for his glory as we serve him. We should be living with a constant focus on him. And so as we live our lives, we should always be asking, how should my faith in God impact this area of my life or that area of my life? How should my faith in God impact how fast I drive? How should my faith in God impact what I eat? How I take care of myself? How should my faith in God impact how I spend and manage my money? We should live with a constant focus on God. Remembering that our lives are to serve Him. And if we're honest, we probably don't like the thought of our lives simply being about serving God. We don't really like the idea of being stuck serving anyone. It, it, it sounds like slavery. But that changes when we understand the kind of God that we serve. And so as we transition from looking at Balaam's foolishness, we're now going to look at God's faithfulness, learning about the God that we have the privilege of serving with our lives. And God beautifully demonstrates his faithfulness in this passage. You see, God had promised to bless his people, the Israelites. And now as these forces of evil, Balak and, and Balaam and others, were coming against the Israelites. God was protecting them. He was not going to allow his people to be cursed. So instead, he changes this curse into a blessing. He didn't let Balaam curse the Israelites. Instead, he made Balaam bless them. And it's interesting to think that the Israelites at that point probably didn't even know what was going on up on the hill. They didn't know that someone was trying to curse them. 
But God was working behind the scenes for their protection, for their benefit, protecting them from evil. That is the kind of faithful God that we serve. And we can take comfort in that. We can take comfort knowing that nothing can touch us without God's permission. No evil powers, no evil spirits, not even Satan himself can touch us without God's permission. No other people in this world, even ones that would oppose us, ones that would be our enemies, they cannot touch us without God's permission. Even COVID-19, even a deadly disease cannot touch us without God's permission. God protects his people. Now in that situation, that doesn't mean that there aren't Christians who are dying from this disease. It doesn't mean that God protects us from everything on this earth. Sometimes he did, sometimes he does, as he did for the Israelites in this situation. But sometimes he doesn't. But you see, God knows that COVID-19 is not our greatest problem. It is not our greatest enemy. God rescued the Israelites from the forces of evil in the situation of Balaam and Balak. But he knew that there was a greater rescue that needed to happen. And this rescue is alluded to in Numbers chapter 24, verse 15, or verse 17, Numbers 24, 17. After Balaam blessed the Israelites those three times. Then he said one final thing, that God gave him this message. And again, that's in Numbers 24, looking at verse 17. And he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. That's one of those verses where you just catch a little glimpse of the Savior that God had promised. That someone greater was going to come. There it describes a star shall come out of Jacob. And if you were to look in the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to as the bright and morning star. You see, even as God was protecting his people from the forces of evil there, he was also continuing his plan to, to bring the ultimate rescue from the forces of evil. The rescue that would come through Jesus. You see, in Christ, God turned a curse into a blessing for his people. In Galatians 3.13, explains this for us a little bit. Galatians chapter 3 Verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You see, as Christ hung on the cross for us, he took upon himself the curse of sin and the curse of the condemnation and the punishment that you and I deserve from God. Jesus took that on himself and he paid for it. And as he did so, he turned that curse into a blessing. He turned the curse of sin and condemnation into the blessing of salvation. And so for those who believe in Christ, we know that sin, death, and the devil has been defeated. We know that as we face various situations in this world, as we have a deadly disease lurking, a deadly disease that may make us a bit worried, as we consider that, we know that in life or in death, our faithful and loving God has given victory. 
has won victory. He has defeated the forces of evil for us. And that's described beautifully for us in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Romans 8, 35 through 39. says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an amazing, faithful, loving, promise-keeping God, rescuing God, we have the privilege of serving with our life. Amen.